Hey! What a day. What a day. So good to, to be here. Hey, a special guest tonight is my wife, Patty. <laughs> there she is. Girls, you meet her afterward. And uh, um, I'm glad she came to, to join us. And uh, I just want to tell you, I was just, I got home last night um, and I thought, man, that was like a pre this pretty heavy message, wasn't it? Um, you know, just to share truthfully from the scripture. And I, I just thought you guys listened so attentively uh, to the word of God. It was encouraging to, to my own soul because sometimes we just have to cover things that always aren't maybe the easiest sometimes to hear. And, uh, but I hope it was helpful. So let's go back to the book of James uh, tonight. And I, I think too, one of the beauties about expositional teaching is I want you to be able to read your Bible when we're done with it. I mean, so that as you, as I walk through it, you'll be able to walk through it. So let me read the section, and I got one more time with you tomorrow, but just again, let's just uh, touch on that, and, uh, and I'll start from verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is accomplished, grows up, or, or grows, you know, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, he says, my beloved brethren. And then this, and it's really linked, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change of his own will he he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures let's let's just bow in a word of prayer father thanks for the this book thank you for the marvelous truth thank you that it instructs us on life and godliness and it's a path for us and the path is always one of joy and blessing to those who follow thanks for these men and women father that have gathered here up at joshua i pray that you encourage them i'm so encouraged to meet them and hear some of their stories and hear what you're doing in their life and i pray that this would further that, that they might see something of your good character, Father, and understand your goodness even in the midst of trials and even in the midst of a temptation, Father. And so we look to you and trust you now in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah, it's been really good for me just to sit with you and get to know some of you, and I'm so encouraged, and obviously a big day for McKinsey to, to, to go home. Thank you for loving her so well, and I think uh, that was hard for her to leave too, but we trust in God in the midst of all of those things. Now remember, as we began this book on what Monday night, I just wanted to draw you to that one area area of sin and temptation. And I said, we're kind of looking at two broad sweeping movements. One was the source of temptation. And then secondly, the strength of God's character. And when we were looking at that first one on the source of temptation, we were answering the question, where does temptation come from? And you remember, we just said there's a rejection stated, right? Let no one say when he's being tempted, I'm being tempted by God. He, he puts that out strongly. Let no man or woman make such a claim. Then secondly, under that, he gives the, the reason for that because God is holy 
it follows that if he's not tempted to evil, he won't tempt anyone to evil himself. And then we got to that third point, and that's where we left off on the reality clarified. And when we meant the reality clarified, if it doesn't come from God, the reality is, as we said, that it comes from our own desire. And then we finished last night with the desire, the deception, the disobedience, the deformity, right? It gives birth to sin. And then finally, it's death that when it's fully grown, it leads ultimately to death. Now, now look, as you're reading the Bible, look at verse 16 again. I left off here. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. And we just said, sometimes you're reading like, well, where does that thing come in? Well, it's real clear. He, he's exonerating, if you will, the character of God, that he in no way is responsible for sin. The one who is responsible is us. It comes out of our heart, out of our own unrede- our unredeemed flesh. We're saved. But as a believer, you can, you can still struggle with sin and give into that. And so he's just saying, don't be deceived. It's, it's not God, okay? It doesn't originate with him. He is always good, only good, and the giver of good gifts. So look at verse 17. Now he turns the corner there. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So let me just explain that to you. And I'm bringing you now from the first point, the source of temptation, because I don't have a PowerPoint, to the secondly, the strength of God's character. And, and, and now he's not going to just say, don't be deceived. He's going to teach you something about the character of God. And what you're going to see displayed in verse 17 and 18 is his goodness. In other words, he's never going to do something to submarine your faith. He's going to allow trials, bring trials to strengthen you, to make you more like Christ, but he's never going to tempt you and then blame it on you as though he brought it and you fell and and now, God, you're the one who brought it. Oh, no, he's going to show the goodness of God here. Now, let me just see if I can explain it to you. The issue as we approach the text is this is, have you ever wondered how does this actually fit into the passage? And remember, James is correcting erroneous views of God's character in the midst of trials, okay? God does not send trials to send you into the pit of despair. He sends trials, as we said, to strengthen your faith. But you may think, God has handed me, and I think this is, he's eavesdropping again. You may think, and maybe this is how James is looking at it, that God has handed me a wrong trial. I just think of all the things I've dealt with in pastoral ministry of a spouse who is detached emotionally or physically uh, in a marriage. Maybe a job that doesn't pan out. Maybe a child who's disobedient. Maybe a womb for one particular woman that can't conceive or some kind of debt that won't go away or some kind of childhood memory that just is upon your heart and mind and somehow it just can't seem to be a Raised. And the question would come up, is God still good? And what James is saying to you is he's only good. He's always good. He's good all the time, even in the hardships of life. So listen, McKinsey went back down the hill. Just honest with you. I watched you love her real well. I got a chance to pray with her last night. But in my mind... God is only good. It might not make sense to her. She wants to be with you. She wanted to stay the whole year. But I just know this. God's allowed this to come into her life, a fluctuating blood sugar level that she hasn't been able to get under control for. We don't know the reason. But it would never enter my mind that God is sucking something away from Mackenzie. 
In fact, I'm left with the thought, biblically, what's God going to do in that young woman's heart? How is God going to use this for his glory to further her in whatever the plan that he has for her? And certainly it's hard. I can tell you guys love her. She loves you. But invariably, as you begin to train your mind biblically, not just casting it off, God's sovereign, God's providential. Oh, no, no, no. He loves her and he has a perfect plan for her. And that trial that has come into her life may be discomforting and it may not be easy, but I promise you, as she submits to God in the midst of this, that young woman is going to grow in some ways in a greater way as she walks you know, back home than she could here, which seems hard because she really wants to be here. And James is writing to a people who were suffering persecution because of their faith in Christ. Remember, he said, I'm writing to the scattered churches abroad. They were being persecuted persecuted, and maybe it was causing some of them to be disappointed, and I don't even like to say this, but become angry with God. And, I, and I've just told you this, as a pastor, I have met time and time people who think God dealt me the wrong card, like the quarterback I told you about the other night. God, why'd you let that guy come into me and ruin my rotator cuff? Maybe it could be that here in the writing, maybe some of you, a good God would not allow for such things to happen to his people. Now listen, this is not new. This idea of doubting God's goodness is as old as the human race, and you know this. Masquerading as as a serpent in the garden, Satan came to Eve in the garden. And you know the account. Has indeed God said, you shall not eat from every tree in the garden? Now, it's just amazing what he does. They could eat from all the trees except this one. But somehow, here he comes as the whispering one, causing her to doubt the goodness of God by limiting something from Adam and Eve. Has he really said that, you know, you can't eat from the every tree of the garden? He was casting doubt, listen, on the goodness of God, right? Is it really true, Eve, that God does not allow you to eat of all the trees in the garden? And the implication would be is if God is good, he would have allowed Adam and Eve to eat of all the trees without so much as one single exception, okay? That's, that's how he works. Satan has never let up on this questioning on the goodness of God. Um, sickness comes. You, you've experienced this. Love one dies. That dies, friends fail you, conflict enters into your life, and Satan comes along saying this, if God were really good, you really wouldn't be going through this. And, I, and I'm just saying to you quietly tonight, be real careful. Be real careful that you're not lured out. Be real careful that you're not enticed. Be real careful as we make decisions that what becomes a trial turns into a temptation. And then all of a sudden there are a people blaming God. And listen, I, I deal with people, uh, lots of people, some older than you, people who can't forgive their parents, people who can't forgive their dad, people who never thought, gosh, why didn't he protect me in the midst of this? And you get going down a track and all of a sudden your view is skewed. Listen, I'm just telling you, students, here's what James is doing. Here's the source. It's not God. It's your own sin, okay? And here, the strength of God's character, he's going to tell us that he's good. But Satan also works not just on the doubting side, he works on the other side of the equation. He not only sees the, the presence of the difficulty, okay, not only uses that, but he also uses the absence of blessing. If God were really good, you would have this or that. I mean, this is the the, the FOMO stage, the fear of missing out. Other people have something that we don't have. And any time we doubt the goodness of God, you and myself are being deceived. 
In fact, I would say this, it's impossible to walk with God if you question his goodness. And I don't mean that like a mean teacher. If he, but you can't walk with the Lord, maybe say be filled with the Spirit and doubt that he's good, okay? So for those tempted to doubt God's goodness, here's what James does. It's not hard to understand. He makes two, I call them stunning statements, okay? of God's gifts to us. What he does is he gives us two affirmations of God's gifts that declare God's goodness in the midst of a temptation, okay? Two affirmations of his gifts that declare his goodness in the midst of a temptation. And I just want to share it with you and share what this means and hopefully it will stay in your minds. But first, let's, uh, under that point, I'm going to go point A, his stable character. His stable character. In other words, he's telling you about God now. So I'm actually telling you something that is unbelievable that we get to sit and listen to. It's not me, it's his word. I'm telling you something about God. This is his word. This is his very breath. And I'm going to tell you something about his character, okay? First, his stable character. Look what he says. Just look at it. Verse 17. Every good gift, and he says, and every perfect gift, okay? Two different words that express the nature of God's marvelous giving, so you say, well, what is God like? Well, James is telling us. It says every good gift, okay? And he uses one Greek word there. It's the word dosis. And it's a word that denotes action. In other words, every good gift, it is the act of giving. I don't know what your view of God is. You might think he's trying to rain on your parade. You might think that he's some kind of cosmic killjoy. You might even think that he's angry. Well, he, he does have righteous wrath. We understand that. But here, as he begins to unpack this, he says that every good gift, every act of giving. Now, look at the text again in verse 17. He speaks about every good gift. And obviously, he's using the opposing word in verse 13 to anything that is evil, if you will. So that what James is saying is that God in his nature has never ever created anything evil or anything sinful God is perfect you know that and all that he does is perfect and all that he gives is absolutely good that's the first word look at the second word he says in every interesting perfect gift here the gift in the word is appropriately suited to the person it calls attention, it's interesting, to the motive, if you will, and the purpose of the giver. So he's not only by nature giving, his motive in the giving is, is perfect. So everything with God um, as its source is good. In contrast, students, you get this, to lust that proceeds from within our own hearts, rather with God's character, good gifts come from God. So don't be deceived. Verse 16, God tempts no one to sin. Now look at the text again in verse 17. Every perfect gift is, it says from above and it says coming down from the father of lights. Now, it, it, obviously, these good gifts come from above. He's not talking about Christmas gifts. He's talking about the character of God. It's a participle here in the language, and it just means that good gifts are unceasingly flowing down from above. It's like the water spigot just got turned on, and God who's above is raining down, flowing down these gifts unceasingly flowing down from from above, okay? Then, in other words, they keep coming down. And then look at the text again. I'm just trying to explain it to you, okay? It says, coming down from the Father of what? Lights, right? 
I, I don't, you said, what does that mean? Is there a metaphor? No, it just means he's the father of lights, and it refers to God, obviously, as the creator of lights, okay? Lights are the brilliant sun, they're the reflective moon, they're the twinkling stars, and God, James is saying, is the designer of all of these lights, okay? Do you remember, obviously, in the book of Genesis, God saw that the light was good. He, he created the light. After he said that in 131, he said that everything he had made, behold, it was very good. But track with me here. Because he's the father of lights, you finish the statement, in him there can be no what? Darkness. I mean, we, we get that biblically. You've been studying, okay? In other words, there's no darkness in him that would ever originate in his character. 1 John 5, you know that one? God is light, and in him there is what? No darkness at all, okay? But, but watch this just for a second here. That with God, listen, unlike the creation of lights, look at the text again in verse 17. With whom, backside of it, 17, there is no variation or shadow due to change. So what does that mean? It means this. That is, it means as the sun, you know this, the moon, the stars move in our atmosphere, there are shadows that are cast by that movement upon the earth as it rotates. And we know the moon waxes and wanes, the sun rises and it what? It sets. But here's what he's saying. Not so with God. Not so with God. With God, there's no variation. With God, there's no shadow. And with God, there is absolutely no change. In fact, what it's talking about here is the immutability of God. In fact, we use that word, Malachi 3, 6, 6 says, I, the Lord, do not, what? Remember that? Change. So watch this. The lights, and I'm going to draw this in here in a moment. The lights have seasons. They have these things called eclipses. They have these things called shadows. But God's nature is absolutely unchanging. He is immutable. He never changes at all. There's an author I like. His name is Andrew Wilson. And he wrote a book. It's, it's a neat book. It's called Incomparable. And, and he said this, and so I'll give it to you as a test, okay? Not, he, he just, this is how he writes. Try sitting, he said, completely still. You are not allowed to move anything except for your eyes. Ready? And then he said, almost everything about you is changing right now. Even as you sit, completely still. Your body is changing as every second you produce 25 million cells and your brain processes 100 million new pieces of information. Your location is changing at a rate of 66,000 miles per hour along with the rest of this large lump of rock we call the earth. Earth. This rock is itself changing all the time with the earth's crust moving continuously, continents changing shape, Mount Everest uh, growing five centimeters every year, the sun probably the largest and most steady object you know anything about is changing rather more dramatically. Here's what he said. It is now 50 million tons lighter than it was when you started reading this paragraph. Everything changes except who? Except God. He is utterly immutable. 
He doesn't change in his character. He doesn't change his will. He doesn't change because he's sovereign. And because he's sovereign, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He never has to change his mind. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the first and the last. He is not like you. He is perfect in every way. Sins never touched him. He never changes anything. Everything is moving in this world at the exact pace that God wants it. And he's just trying to say here, he would never be a chameleon in your trial. He would never give you something that you couldn't handle. And I, I say that respectfully because some people have been through awful stuff. And somehow God is going to take someone else's wicked, evil sin because they're wicked and evil. And Romans 8.28 will turn it together for our what? Good. He's going to be working all of that. But listen, the good news today is, is that for all eternity, God is infinitely good. He is unchangeably good. He is eternal. He is immutable. He is unchanging. The God who orders the change in the seasons in his creation does not change. He is, James saying, always good. So let me, let me take you here to the text. To question the goodness of God then is, t- it, I don't know another way to say it. To question the goodness of God is to imply that man is more concerned about goodness than is God. Like you, you, you think you might have a better plan than him? Or somehow he went to sleep on your watch? To, to suggest that, if you think that, that man is kinder than God is to subvert the very nature of God. It is to deny God, and this is precisely the thrust of temptation, to question the goodness of God. Listen, I don't, and I guess I just want to address this to you. I don't know where you are. I'm just up here. Dallas gave me no info to come here. But I, the, James is cr- trying to help me, help you. He's always good. But, but Scott, he brought the trial, and I responded wrong, and it became a temptation. Okay, you responded wrong. Then own that. But I want you to know, he would only bring things in your life to perfect you into the image of Christ. And sometimes that's discipline. Sometimes that's trials. But James says God is good. What's that movie that says that he's good all the time? What movie was that? Yeah, it was just, he's good. He's good all the time, right? The devil and your flesh, the devil or your flesh, will tell you otherwise. He will whisper lies in your ear. He will seek to dethrone God's goodness to you. And God would, that God, but the truth is, God would never entice you to evil. Just never. So he's correcting wrong views about God to those who are doubting his goodness, to those who have become disillusioned, to the point of losing all hope in trials. Listen, this just popped into my mind. When you read James, will you please read? Look, I have to turn the page. Will you please read James 1, um, uh, 19, right? He says, people interpret this wrong. Are you guys in Bible interpretation right now? People butcher this text, and it bugs the stew out of me because I spend my life interpreting the Bible. But look at this, know this for you. Know this, Joshua students, and I'm in 119. My beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to what? (laughs) Anger. He's not talking about communicating with each other. He's saying when you find yourself in the midst of a trial or it becomes a temptation, shut your mouth. That's what he's saying. You need to be quick to hear, slow to what? Speak. And I think he's saying speak against God and slow to anger against the person of God. Listen, I just, I just admit, I mean, I, we're just selfish people. 
You want things, and I'm saying this to myself, your way on your timetable at this place with this person in this environment. And somehow God's just throwing monkey wrenches into your life and into my life all the time. But we need to yield and get under him and make sure that we're recognizing the goodness of God. You guys know this song. Maybe you can finish some of the lines with me. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my what? Father, there is no shadow of turning with what? With thee. What do you mean shadow? He's not a chameleon. He's not going to be angry one day, and then he's going to be nice the other day, and he's going to be ever forever the same, and that's always good. Remember this? It, there, it says there, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest, what? Not... Thy compassions never, what, fail. As, the, as thou hast been, thou forever, what, will be. He's God. And the only thing that comes from God above is that which is good and that which is perfect. So maybe I could take you back to my friend who was the quarterback. And by the way, the, the Lord worked out his life. He came to Christ. Uh, he actually started, he was in my church um, for a little while, and then he abruptly died. I think he took so many drugs, painkillers, that eventually his heart gave way. But he had come back to Christ. And, but, I, but what happens to a young man in high school like that? Well, he's got a plan. He was, his plan was pro football. One of the best quarterbacks in the whole valley. And, and somehow through that trial, it all came crashing down on him. But sadly, rather than thanking the Lord at one time, right, he became angry. And then I told you the story, and he, he lost everything. He lost a lot more than just football as he went on. You say, why? Because I'm like him, you're like him. We, we design the life that, that we think we should have, or the parents, or the girlfriend, or the boyfriend, or the popularity, or the looks, and you just go down a thousand things, but I just, I think if I could say anything, listen, I don't want you to doubt the goodness of God. Number one, here's the first affirmation, his stable character. Secondly, okay, and we'll be done here, but this is, have you ever seen this verse? It's just so profound. It's almost like I read it sometimes and I'm like, I can't believe this is in the Word of God. Like, I can't believe you guys are here. Not because not I'm here, but because of what you're doing at Joshua. Look, of his own will, he's still on God's character. I'm in verse 18. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits. Um, of his creatures. Here's the second affirmation. Not only his stable character, but secondly, his sovereign creation. His sovereign creation. Now, you might ask the question, what does this have to do <laughs> in the context of our sin? And the answer would be everything. Now, James uses, uh, you probably can't see it, it maybe just reading. He uses the same word in verse 18, shocking, as he does in verse 15. You, in verse 15, look back there. We said that last night. He says in verse 15, when sin has conce conceived, it gives what? Birth to sin. So I think you just know he's changed his metaphor from um, fishing, from hunting, to labor and delivery. And he says when sin conceives, it gives birth. In other words, there's conception. And this is what our lust does. It, it, when the will's engaged, it brings forth sin, but then sin grows up. Now, the opposite here, verse 18, God's character, of his own will, and, you, and I'm reading from the ESV, he, and then this word is the same word in Greek, brought us forth. He brought us forth. 
is the thought there, okay? The contrast is this. Sin and lust brings forth death, but the new, the new birth brings forth life. If you, you have to just trust me on this as a Bible teacher. The idea there on to bring forth, what, what is he talking about? Anybody want to take a stab at that? What do, what do you mean he brought us forth? Does anybody know? Anybody want to take a stab what that means? Where's Caitlin from Ukraine? What do you think? Do you know? Come on. Come on. Do you have, did, I, did I catch it? Or I was just keeping her away. Is he, I mean, it's kind of hard. What, what's he talking about bringing us forth? This any Mitchell, what do you think? Anything? I mean, it's hard. I'm admitting it. Yeah. Taking us out of, um, like taking us out of. Cl- close, maybe, yeah. Yeah, you, you know what it means? It, there, there, it, will, it will apply to that. What, what James is saying is, are you kidding me? The, the, it, I'm putting it in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. I'm saying that. But I think he's saying, are you kidding me? He would never lead you into sinful temptation. No, you've got it all wrong, he says, my beloved brothers, brethren. The only thing that God does is he causes you to be born again. The word for bring forth is the same word for the regeneration in the New Testament. What's another word for regeneration? It's John 3, when somebody comes, what? Born again. Listen, don't ever blame God, and I'm not saying any of you are. Don't ever blame God. Are you kidding me? What he's done is he's caused you to be born again. In other words, he's given you the new birth, if you will. He's the one who brought salvation to you by grace, through faith. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 5. Anybody know that verse? And God made you what? Does anybody know what it says? He made you alive. Listen, I don't, we don't have time. It's another subject. He's obviously talking about the sovereignty of God. You did not choose me. Jesus said, I what? I chose you. He caused your heart to wake up. He caused you, if you're a Christian, and by the way, I don't assume all of you know the Lord in here. He caused your heart to be born again. In fact, look at the words. Every word is inspired in verse 18. It says there at the beginning of his own what? Well, he did that. I mean, I can tell you about my life. I'm 14, and I got my fist like this to God. I didn't want anybody to tell me what to do. I didn't want my mom to tell me what to do. I didn't want the church to tell me what to do. I went about lying to get around him. I would make up in my mind that, hey, Scott, when you turn 35, become a Christian. I was 14. You said, was I a bad kid? No, I probably wasn't a bad kid. But in my heart, I was like this. I had my fist in the face of God. And I still remember it distinctively. I'm 14 years old. I'm outside shooting baskets. I was always playing basketball. And it was almost like, a, like an arrow out of heaven. And you know how like God can quicken your mind? Because I'm running from him. I wanted to date who I wanted, to go where I wanted. I didn't want my mom telling me. I didn't want to submit my life to Christ. I'm in eighth grade at this point. And I'm out there shooting buckets. And this scripture sovereignty pops into my mind. It was this one. Do you know it? James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at one point, he's become what? Guilty of all. And I'm just telling you, students, I don't know what happened to me. It was like a harpoon came out of the sky. It buckled me, literally, because it was the first time in my life at 14, I started to go to church at 8, that I thought, oh, Scott, you're not a good guy. You're a sinner. And Scott, you don't have to be a big, gross sinner. All it takes is one sin. And I'll tell you, once that happened, I went into my room, I got down on my knees, and I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ because I realized I was a sinner. You say, well, what happened there? Well, how how do you want to say that? I became born again. I became, do you want a theological word? Regenerated. Do you want the word of Ezekiel the prophet? He gave me a new heart. All I know is when I got off my knees, my knees students, I was a different guy. 
My heart was different. My desires were different. My, the things that I once hated, I now loved. The things that I once loved, I now did. It's not that I became perfect, but he, who did that? God did that. So here what James is saying is, are you kidding me? He would never tempt anyone to sin. He's, a, he's unchanging in his character, flowing down from above his good and perfect gifts. And in the exercise, James says, of his own will, he brought me and he brought you forth. He caused you to be born again. So listen, he's not, he's not ruining you. He's causing you to come to see him. And there's more scriptures that I could say on that. Okay, But listen, just as no human child is ever brought forth by his or her own power, its conception, gestation, and birth are out of that child's control, so too is your spiritual life that God creates in the life of the believer. He changes you. You could never blame God for any kind of sinful temptation. He's, James is just, he's trying to help us think. Listen, don't get sideways on him. Don't get, you need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. He caused you to be born again. Now the question would be, because we're just reading our Bible here, how does he do that? How, how, does he, how does he make someone go from a child of wrath to a child of God? It's in the text. Look at it in verse 18. If you believe it. I mean, I, I, I always see this and I'm stunned. He brought us forth by the what? The word of truth. You say, what does that mean? Well, you, you understand. He uses this book to redeem you. He uses the power of the scripture to change you. He brought into my heart James 2.10. You say, was that charismatic? No, I was probably in junior high discipleship group. But he used that verse. You say, well, Scott, what are you talking about? He causes people to be born again through the power of the word of God. And I got a video today, and, and I hope it's not anybody's local church. I got a video today of a church that's got this big Christmas pageant coming up. I should show you the video. And I'm like, what in the world is this? It's a Christmas pageant at a church, and they named off about five guys. This guy sang in Beauty and the Beast. This guy is a recording artist. This guy is a professional actor. She's been on this TV show. This guy, and, and I'm like, what am I watching? That we're gonna and then it says, we're going to have Santa Claus for the kids. I'm like, are you kidding me? This thing is living and active and we're putting somebody into a Christmas show that the video never mentioned the person of Christ. I couldn't believe it. But I'm telling you, these are the gimmicks today and they abound everywhere. And what James is saying, that book that you're holding is so powerful that it can cause a dead center to come alive by... There it is, the word of truth. But here's the best phrase. It's the last, okay? That, here's the purpose clause. It's kind of a unique thing. Listen, some of you guys need to go in the ministry. People are dying for a lack of knowledge. They're dying because they're not taught the scripture. And maybe that would be God's prayer that some of you should go to the mission field, uh, men or women, some of you who become pastors. But, but look at this last line there, that we should be <laughs> uh, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I mean, that's kind of really hard. Does it, ben, you want to take a stab at that one? I mean, I mean, I'm just saying that's hard. Gary, what, what's, what does that mean? You got to dig a little bit, and that's not fair because I was digging, but uh, what do you think, Caleb? Um, maybe setting, like, the foundation for the church. Yeah, there's part of that. I'll just be brief here, okay? You guys have been listening really good. Do you remember in the Old Testament when they would pull their crops and they were told and commanded by God to set the crops aside. They were to set 10% of the crops aside for the poor people, okay? 
They were called the first fruits. It's kind of like a tithe, but I probably shouldn't say that. They just said, if you're farming, you need out of the produce that's produced, you need to set aside the first fruits of your harvest for somebody else. But in the Levitical system, you can check this out. The first fruits were set aside, does anybody know the way to finish this statement, to, to be what? Consecrated, what's another word for consecrated? Holy, right? Same word, consecrated, holy, whoever got that. Uh, if you were in my family growing up and my kid answered that question, I would say bingo schmingo, okay? <laughs> they were set aside as first fruits, they were consecrated unto the Lord. And then the word came to mean set aside first fruits to be holy unto the Lord. So all James is saying here is, listen, far from placing sin in your life, are you kidding me? He caused you and I to be born again through the power of the word of God for this in mind, that you would be set aside to be holy unto him. That's what it means. He's not tubing anyone. He's not a cosmic killjoy. He's not a mean God. He is a gracious, giving God who's got the spigot on towards his people all the time. All the time. In fact, don't blame sin on him. Are you kidding me? He's actually set you aside through the power of the word of God that you would be holy unto the Lord. That's what it is to be a believer. He uses the power of his word to redeem people, to set them aside through the power of the word of God that we would be a people that are set apart or who said consecrated? Who said that word? Good word, Tanner. There you go, man. So, I mean, you're a scholar, okay? You just give, give, give him some love. Give him some love. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Come on. There he is. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm done. You guys have been so patient. What a week. What an emotional day. With Where's McKinsey's roommate? Is it Danica? The whole time, for the last two days, I thought you were McKinsey. I thought you were the one going home. But it was, it was Mackenzie. You were hugging her. She's your roommate. So we need to keep praying for her. So anyway, do you guys have any quick questions? Kate from Ukraine, come on. Is there any, is there any burning? Where, where's, uh, where's our other Ukrainian? Where? There's, there, I missed you. Um, uh, any, any burning question? Any burning Listen, you guys, this is, the, walk through the text. Let me just make a comment. Step by step, word by word, the Bible is clear. It's the greatest book that's ever been written, and it was written in sequence, and it's written to be understood. Yeah. Uh, we've talked a lot about temptation. Yes. We let it grow. Uh, right. Uh, do you have any, like, advice on how to, like, stop it? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And I, I didn't, I haven't really said anything on that. We'll look tomorrow at one of the means to do that. But it's a great question. Like, one of them would be, how do you, you could look at it negatively or positively, but because I, I'm an exhorter, let me put it positively. One of the best ways to have a great defense is to have a good, what? Offense. Part of that is just to be in the Word of God. Like, I'm not making light of that. I read my Bible today because I know I don't ever want to be a professional pastor. I need to be in the Scripture. So you have a good offense. You, you, you read the Scripture. You do not conform to this world, but you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Caleb, we were talking about what you're memorizing. You gave me a verse today that was great out of the book of Philippians. What, what was it? That were to be blameless, right? What, uh, without blemish. Without blemish. In the midst of this crooked. crooked. Oh, so listen, our hearts want, so you take the means of grace, you take the word of God, you take the subject of prayer, you take the fellowship of believers, right? Like where's Christopher, where are you there? Dude, I just, come on, baby, let's hear it for him. The Danish man. Um, 
I was just so thankful to talk to you to, that God brought you here. He told me, I don't know if you told him, I don't know if that was a real personal thing, like I'm going to sin right now, but he, you were at a point where you're wondering what the next step was in your life, and it popped into your mind, hey, my cousin went to Hume, and that would be the right place for me. And I'm just so glad you're here, because back to that, as you guys fill your mind with the Word of God, fill it with fellowship, fill it with worship, fill it with the one another's, when you're doing the right thing, it often keeps you from doing the wrong thing. So back to David, at the time when he should have been out at war, he looks down on his balcony, and I still don't think that's sin. I just think he had to shut that down. And, and then I remember the promises of God. No temptation, you can say it with me, has overtaken you, but such as is what? Common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with every temptation, he will provide you a way of what? escape that you may be able to endure. And so you put the promises of God. How about when the psalmist said in 119, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against me. Listen, I know this as a Bible teacher. You can't, you, how would I say this? You can't think on two things at the same time. Now, I'm not talking about multitasking, but I promise you this. You can't dwell on something impure and then be thinking at the same time about what the victory Christ wrought for you in, his, in your life on the cross. And so what you feed is what grows. But you got to have the right offense. Put the word of God in there. Don't be at the wrong place. Don't hang out with the wrong people. You know the text, bad company corrupts what? Good morals. You will become nothing more, nothing less than the next three years of who, what you read and who you hang around with. And I would say pick your friends wisely. So those are all, I, I look at those as strategies that, that keep you away from the evil one. But I was studying today for Sunday. I'm still thinking of the promises of God. James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will what? flee from you but you got to resist them you got to stand your ground and so as you put those promises in your life you know i might even uh, push you back it's jt right good i always want to say tjj there's something that piper did on how to fight temptation and sin maybe when the internet comes on you can go on look at that on desiring god is very very helpful for piper he uses these things called fighter verses and uh and the other thing that i would say to you and this might sound counterintuitive the greatest way to holiness is not through legalism the greatest way to holiness is by grace and when you and I become stunned by his amazing grace, I, don't, I think the things of the world are going to seem less. We forget the grace that's been extended to us. When we understand that, grace always invariably leads to holiness, not legalism. So listen, be more amazed by his grace, but put yourself in the book. Put yourself around other people. I, I, maybe this is a dumb story. I'm in eighth grade, and I don't even, this is not about me, but I'm driving, I'm riding my bike, not driving my bike, I'm riding my bike, and I go over to my friend's house, he's my friend, we all play basketball all hours of the day, and as I, I think it was in the summer of eighth grade, it might have been ninth grade, I forget, as I pulled into his garage, I could smell you know, just that marijuana smell. And it's just coming out of the garage. And I just, I praise God. I was a believer at that time. I'm 14, so I don't, this is not me as Superman. But I just remember as I pulled into the driveway, I just turned around and I left. Because I thought, I don't want to be around that. And that guy went on to become the biggest drug dealer in the entire San Fernando Valley. Guy I grew up with, named Craig Norvell. He ended up getting saved later on, but he was the biggest dealer in the whole San Fernando Valley. Listen, you can't walk holy with God and walk unholy 
with people. So you put the word in your heart, you put prayer in your heart, you, you put fellowship, you're, you're with the right people. I mean, most of you are just really enjoying this, aren't you? What a, what a blessing you get. But listen, I want to tell you something. You got to take advantage of every week here because you have no idea what's coming to your generation. And I'm not trying to scare you. I mean, the Senate just passed another bill. Patty, what was that act called last yesterday? The act of marriage? Freedom of marriage. Yeah, they just made everything legal. What was shocking about it is 12 Republican senators signed that. So what they signed is completely contrary to what the Bible says. But what's even shocking is all the people that had reversed their votes in the Senate uh, 26 years previous who would have voted for the institution of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, I just know if our world has come that quick in 26 years to the place where we can't even identify what a man and a woman is, you better put your armor on because you're going to have to be equipped to fight this battle. And so, listen, you, you're here, study, grow, pray, serve each other. But look at that article. But those are the things that help me. I mean, you got to be careful of that iPhone I was telling some of the guys, I, uh, you know my son Johnny, about three years ago, um, he said, Dad, come to, what's that thing on Friday night? What do they call that? Vi vi victory, what's it called? Victory circle, right? It's men and women, then the women go down, then the guys are up there. And Johnny was talking about cell phones. And I, you know, I'm kind of an intense guy, right? But I thought, man, I was nothing to how intense he was that night. I was sitting, you know, behind the stage. So I, let's say there's 500 dudes there. And I was like this in my, like, I, <laughs> he was like, take that phone, smash that phone. And I'm like, whoa, dude, chill, you know. He goes, go get a hammer. And, and, and he was just going. And he goes, I'm telling you this because I love you. And they'd say, we love you too, Johnny. It was just, I mean, and I said, Johnny, afterward, you were so intense. He goes, dad, you have no idea. You have no idea of the men that I talk to daily here who are just down a road on that stuff with their phone. And that doesn't mean you, that women aren't exempt from this. But I said, really? He goes, and I thought, I'm older. I have no idea that, you know, my youth pastors tell me third graders have Apple iPhones now. Is that right? I mean, I'm just shocked. And you guys, Patty, you don't know this. They're under a fast. No social media, right? And uh, come on, let's go. Come on. And uh, so listen, I, I say all that because those are all means of grace. I do think that the, the, other, the last thing I'll say on that is if you're at a right church, it's almost make me cry, and you got a good pastor who's not doing dog and pony tricks and event after event and five practical ditties on this and how to have a successful life and here's your life coach over here excuse me if that hurts anybody all I know is I sat under my pastor and every week he unleashed such a high view of the character of God that as I grew up in my teenage years I never wanted to offend the Lord that he described to me but I feel like now we've got such shallow views and there's no, maybe at that point, there's no fear of God. Have a healthy fear of God. Remember when the writer of Ecclesiastes says, when it's all said and done, fear God and keep his what? Commandments. He said, for this applies to all. That's a good question though. I hope that helped. Any more? One more? Yeah. Hey, what was the yeah. guy's name? The one with the five verses that you're talking about the article? John Piper. And I think it, it might even be how to succeed over temptation. And he had 10 points on it. And I just thought it was helpful. Some of the things that I said. John Piper, desiring God, how to be victorious over temptation. If you hit it in desiring God, it will come up. You know what I like about John Piper? Is... Um, his son was in our church in Chicago. And uh, he, he uh, 
I go to conferences where he was, he's a real unique guy. He comes up to about here on me. He's just real small. And I, I'm there like four days at this conference and he wears the same coat. And he, do you guys know Piper? You know who he is, right? He wears the same coat and the same tie every day. And I'm like, man, mix it up, dude. I mean, you know, and so I went up to him at the end because he's just on fire when he preaches. I said, hey, I just have a question for you. Yeah, Scott. I said, if, how could I preach like you when I'm 60? And I just never forget his response. This little smile. He was kind of, he seemed like a grandpa to me. Maybe I seem like a grandpa to you. I am a grandpa. But uh, he, 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 he said to me, just this simple line, if you want to keep your passion and you want to pre keep preaching, he said, just fall more in love with Jesus every day. And he says, the more you walk with him, the more that passion will come out. And there's that. There's that vitality, you know, blessed is the man, right, who does not walk in the path of the wicked, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, nor stand in the place of sinners, but his delight, finish it, is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he meditates how much? Day and night. Listen, gobble it up. Can I pray for us? Are we, we have cookies tonight, Morris? Okay. Listen, women, over here is my wife, the most godly woman that I know. I, Patty, I told him the story that after I met you, I went and got my Bible and went like this. I got the dust off it because I thought, wow, this girl is walking with the Lord. So if you get a chance, meet her, a little preview tomorrow. I'll keep going in James and we'll talk about the power of the word of God. Let me pray for you. Father, thanks for our time. It's been sweet. Thanks, obviously, most of all, for the power of the word of God. Father, you just are a good God. You're good all the time. Lord, forgive us for low, impoverished views of you. Build into our hearts a high view. Thank you for these men and women. Lord, uh, one less today with Mac, and I just pray your blessing upon her. Help these students stay in touch with her, and just grateful for her. I trust you. You're an all-wise, infinite God. You'll do what's best for her, even if it's hard for her to be away. But fill her with your spirit. Fill all these students with your heart, your mind, your joy. And we're just going to give you all the praise. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, if anything tonight, we are such fallen creatures that even though re redeemed, we still fall. But Lord, there's one who never fell, and it was the, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that in all of his temptations, he responded, it is written. So Father, where we fall short, thank you that he kept the law perfectly, and our righteousness is his, not our own. So remind us of that. We love you and give thanks, and all God's children said, amen. amen. All right, you guys.